So this morning I'll share with you a story about a pastor. And you know, we all fall into temptation sometimes in some form or another. And well, this pastor, he was falling into temptation. You see, he really wanted to go play golf Sunday morning. And he got up and he just he just felt that de desire to go play golf. And so he, he decided, well, I'm going to call up the church council and the leaders of the church. And so he did. And they answered the phone and said, hello, uh, I can't come in. I'm not feeling too well. And they were like, well, well, you understand, Pastor, it's OK. You can we'll make do and, and you just take care of yourself and hung up. And he was he was like, all right. Now I get to go play. And he got his clubs together and he goes out to the course and he's so happy. Now that first hole on the course um, is a par five. And if you don't know too much about golf, that is one of the harder uh, holes to play. And it's also one of the longest holes to play. And so he's up on that par five. And it's his first shot of the day and he's, he tees up and he gets his club and he rears back and he lets that go. And he just hits it perfect on his driver on that big old big old driver and that ball's just a flying in fact it starts defying the laws of physics it's flying so well and there it goes 535 yards and then it lands on the green and then it slowly rolls on the green and goes right into the hole and then the voice from on high said now, who is going to believe you? <laughs> you know, sometimes we, we get into areas in life that um, we tend to think that we are doing things like we're supposed to be doing, but then we lose sight of what we're supposed to do. Uh, I'll, well... I'll give it to you like this. I, now, I'll tell you, I'm not like that pastor in the story, but I do like golf. OK, uh, I'm not be calling in on a Sunday morning, but I do like golf. I like golf a lot. I've got my clubs. I'm a Callaway person. That's a brand of clubs. I love Callaway. I didn't want to spend the money on the Callaways, so I bought some knockoffs. They look just like Callaways. They play just like Callaways. I enjoy, I, I like using the little golf balls that have the, like a hex angle, like a hexagon little dots on the ball. So that way they'll fly further. Uh, I just enjoy getting out into nature and getting to see the wonders of God as we're playing golf. And, and just, uh, I have it, all, all my stuff. Uh, I've learned so much about the, the game of golf and, and knowing how to drive and to hit right and, and how you position your legs just right in order to make the ball do these crazy things and hook and slice and fade and uh, just all kinds of stuff. I just, uh, it's very enjoyable. Now with all these things that I've told you about my passion for golf, would you consider me a golfer? How about if I told you I haven't played in about eight months? And before that, it was four years before I even picked up a club. Would I still be a golfer? You know, a person that actually is a golfer spends time on the golf course and spends time playing a game. A golfer puts their time and effort into what they are doing. See, I can talk the talk, I can walk the walk, but if you put me to the test, you will find that I am not a golfer. Our scripture lesson this morning, Paul is talking in Galatia, who writes a letter to Galatia, and he's talking to these people that are called Judaizers. And what they were, were a group of people that they were OK with the aspect of Jesus. But you, according to them, still needed to do these things to merit a credit in order for God to fully accept you. You had to be somebody that, OK, even if you were a Jew or Gentile, if you're going to accept uh, this, this Jesus, you've got to do what God says. You've got to follow the law. You've got to get circumcised. You've got to go through all these arts and practices of what you need to do for God to accept you. And so Paul writes and he says, no, no, this is you're missing the point of what I'm trying to 
to tell you what this message about Jesus is about. You see, it's about grace. It is about the grace that comes from God through Jesus Christ. Christ who perfected the law, but then through him and his grace was able to save all. And so Paul writes in the second chapter of Galatians, starting with verse 15, he says, We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have to put our faith in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If we, if while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners. Does that not mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I am a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I live. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. It's words of God for the people of God. <clears throat> Thanks be to God. <clears throat> when Paul is talking to these people, these Judaizers, he's wanting them to understand that there is an aspect of worship that needs to take place. But it is not by the law that we are saved. It is by grace. Grace that is found in Jesus Christ. That is the saving factor. You know, oftentimes in Western civilization of the church, we have put a lot of stock into the aspect of having church. Into the music. Into the worship aspect. We put so much stuff into the aspect of playing church that we forget about the aspect of Christ. And it's very unfortunate because when that happens, you begin to fall into the same trap that was going on back in the day that this letter was written. Where the churches were distorting a message and actually hurting people spiritually. Paul emphasizes that it's the grace of God. In Romans 10.10, 10, he reminds us. As well, for it is with your heart that you believe and you are justified and is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. It is this profession of faith and the understanding in the heart that transforms our lives. The Holy Spirit begins to work. We need to have that aspect in our lives of knowing that and putting our foundation back into Christ. Because when we do that, all things begin to work as they're supposed to work. Because we do need church. We need church to be nurtured. We need church to learn. We need church to help us in our daily lives. You know, I, I said again, you know, when I asked the question, am I a golfer? And, and put me to the test. If, if I go out and play golf against one of these super professional guys that play golf, you will, uh, and I, uh, here's a lesson for you. If you've never played golf, the lowest score wins the game, okay? <laughs> Unfortunately, I would be one with a super high score, all right? Uh, because if you put me to the test, I may talk the talk, I may walk the walk, I may even have the equipment, but when I put it to the test, I will fail. You know, when it comes to the faith, in Jesus Christ, if you don't have a full commitment of that faith, when you are put to the te test, you will fall. You have to have that full commitment, a humble commitment to Christ. So that way, when the world throws whatever it's going to throw at you, you have a confidence that when you're put to the test, you will be able to overcome. And church helps you do that. 
Church helps nurture you to where you need to be. But Christ has to be at the center of all things. Grace has to be preached. The grace that offers salvation through Jesus Christ has to be the center message of music, the center message of prayer, the center message of our gathering in the building. Christ has to be the center, the grace that gives and restores and saves has to be the center for it to be our, in our daily walk. John Wesley, in one of his sermons, The Almost Christian, back in 1741, his sermon was all about this idea, this concept. He said, you know, the almost Christian loves God. The almost Christian loves Jesus. The almost Christian has a very pious personal life in which they, they pray, they read scripture, they take of communion. The almost Christian engages in social holiness, gathers together as people. The almost Christian works to help the community. The almost Christian does many things for the aspect of Christ. But the difference between the almost Christian and the absolute Christian is sincerity. You know, we can we can learn Bible verses all day long. We can have small group studies all day long. We can we can sing hymns all day long. But if there's not a sincerity in our heart, a compassion for Christ, then it's all for naught. And that's what Paul is is saying to these Judaizers, it's not about the law. It is about Christ. Christ came and perf perfected the law. Because once we've been established, once we've been saved by grace, we shouldn't go back to that old life anymore. We should be living a life that is in line with God's will, with God's law. But it is not by the law that we are justified and saved. It is by the grace of God. You see, if you allow Christ into your heart and the Holy Spirit to transform you, you will find that you will experience life in a new and more excellent way. And you will find that there are aspects in life that you are wanting to be part of because the Holy Spirit is compelling you to help your neighbor. The Holy Spirit is compelling you to love the stranger. The Holy Spirit is compelling you to feed the hungry. The Holy Spirit is compelling you to want to be more and learn more and love more through the Holy Spirit. But it all stems from that foundation of grace. Allowing God to transform you by that justifying grace found in Christ Jesus. The psalmist in Psalm 119 said, when we're talking about putting away the the old life says, put false ways far from me. Lord, graciously teach me your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I set your ordinances before me and I cling to your desires, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. Church, we need to get back to basics. It's as simple as that. We need to get back to Christ. And allowing Christ to be foremost in what we do sincerely. With humble hearts. Allowing ourselves to be transformed. Allowing God to be at the center. Knowing that Christ through that grace saves us. And if that is the foremost foundation. Then not only does it transform us. It begins to transform our church. It begins to transform our communities and our homes. Things begin to work as they're supposed to work, but it all stems from having that foundation of faith found in Christ. And it's a faith that's found by accepting grace, not merit, not works that save you, but grace, 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 God's grace, glorious, wonderful grace so I ask you this day have you accepted that grace and if you have brothers and sisters that grace 
is enough. That grace is enough to save you. That grace is enough to transform you. That grace is enough to give you confidence to face a fallen world and to show others the love of God. Grace, wonderful grace, amazing grace. Amen. Our final hymn this morning, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And that's found on page 526 of your hymnal. 526.